Happy Friday. Today we're going to be checking out the D&D 5e rule set. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a change up today for my normal content. I haven't done this in a while, so we're going to do a character creation. I do these every so often, kind of keep it up to date, kind of fresh. So this will be based off the latest version of Fantasy Grounds, which is version 4.5.6. It is April 19th, 2024, if you're watching this in the future. So let's get into this. So basically, I have a new campaign that I've started. If you are a player, you're going to need to access either your own session and you have your own content, or you're going to connect to your GM who can share the books with you and give you the ab ability to create characters uh, by yourself. However, in this case, I'm going to build them on my table. Uh, I have full control of it. I have a lot of content, so we can do this um, uh, in this particular session. So I'm going to load this. There are some... Um, items out there some extensions that might help you with building but in this case i'm only going to use the, the leather theme and i'm using a font for the uh, roboto so this is a uh, to make the text in the chat window a little bigger so that's all the only um, extensions i'm going to use but if i was going to be building for like a large group or if i needed to put together like six characters of pregens i would use some other extensions to kind of make that quicker so we're going to cover the drag and drop method and we're going to cover the character wizard character wizard will save you about 10 to 15 minutes per character so if you're making six of them that will help uh, quite a bit when you're working with fantasy grounds and if you are using custom content third-party content like kobold press and you know and then your homebrew stuff I recommend you use the drag and drop method because that will work better. Um, the character wizard may or may not pick up some of the custom changes that you're making for your particular table. So kind of, you know, be prepared for that. So if you're going to use just uh, the core books, you know, the official Wizards of the Coast content, the character wizard works pretty good. If you're going to do a bunch of content that is not Wizards of the Coast or stuff that you've made yourself with homebrew, you're going to want to do the drag and drop method. So the first method that we're going to be doing is the character wizard. So this will assume that you have access to the rules or you have your own license and your own content. So if I go into the modules up here on the top right, I can activate whatever books I want. As you can see, I have these Rob 2E effects coding here, which are optional. And then there is the SRD content, and then there's some Lost Mine uh, content. So I can get by with just playing using the pregens that are already built, and I don't have to do anything at that point. I can just assign those to my characters or, or my players and let them pick which characters they want. However, when you want to build something from scratch and you don't have access to, to the content, it's really hard to do. So what I'm going to do is kind of clear the table here, or clear the slate. So I'm opening up the module activation window, and really the I'd only need a couple books. I don't need all this stuff. So if I go to the load filter, that will show me all of the stuff that is basically active, so I don't need a bunch of these things here. I only need just a few modules. So I'm deactivating the content that I don't need for this session. And this is an important thing for GMs. If you've got a ton of content and you're not going to be using it or you're not certain, you know, I would just unload it and, until you need it. A lot of the times people will have 50 gazillion things open at once and they don't really need half of it. So that'll help save a little bit for your... Um, for your content so it's not too too much for your players so if that information is not getting transferred back and forth for no reason so you don't need a ton of books uh, loaded so that is that so what I want to do now is load the player's handbook so even if you don't have a bunch of stuff or a bunch of content the player's handbook is probably the most useful out of all the books for the 5e rule set so even if it's Pathfinder or one of the other books, just having the you know a couple core rule books is probably your best bet. All that other stuff is kind of over the top, so you don't necessarily have to get all of those. 
And if you know what you're doing in Fantasy Grounds, you can kind of build your own stuff anyway. So once you have the core basics down and you understand how the interface interacts with the rule set, you can kind of make your own. I wouldn't suggest that right off the bat. It is kind of takes a little bit of practice and such and kind of understanding how the character sheets work and, and that sort of thing. But you can eventually build your own content if you want. So this is going to just be basically the player's handbook. Um, I might load like Tasha's if you have it. That gives you a few more options. And then um, basically Tasha's and there's a couple other books that give you more character creation options. So that like Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has a player's version and then the GM's version. You only need the player's version if you're just going to build characters. And then you might take like Xanathar's Guide is another good one to load. So there's the player's guide. If you plan on playing non-humans, you know, or non-standard races, the Monsters of the Multiverse is the other book that you want to get. And essentially that is... Uh, a collection from a bunch of other books. So that replaced um, Morden Canaan's and it replaced Temple of Elemental Evil and it includes things like the the Tortle and some other things from other books. So it kind of combined a lot of the non-human races together. So you don't necessarily have to have Volo's Guide um, anymore. However, if you have it, you can still use it, but it's just no longer going to be sold. So I just loaded a few books. You don't, like I said, you don't need to have everything um, under the sun loaded. Uh, if you know what your build is going to be and what sources are going to be used, you can just lo load those. This will help reduce the impact on your players and help with the, uh, you know, getting lag and that sort of thing, especially when you first connect. Um, I recommend that you'd have your players connect one at a time instead of everyone at once. Because that can be pretty taxing on the on the network initially, but once everyone's connected and all the books are cached and downloaded, it should be fairly easy after that. All right, so just got like a few books loaded. Let me look at the load filter and get rid of this. And if you see over here on the left, this is all the books I have loaded. So I got a couple of character creation books, and then I have these. Uh, Rob 2E effects coding, just a few I might need. And then if you want to, if you're going to be playing in the Forgotten Realms, you might load up the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. So it kind of depends on on what, what your needs are and where you're playing and such. So here's the player's reference for that. So that one has a bunch of um, kind of like content that's more focused on the Forgotten Realms. But if you're not playing in the Forgotten Realms, you probably don't need it. So these are just things that uh, you'll learn over time. It's really hard to know what exact content is in each book unless you do some research and you write it down or you make your own list. So anyways, this is the kind of the loadout that I would have initially. And then once I have the characters built, I'd probably deactivate half of these because you won't need most of it after third level. Because generally speaking, you get your archetype by third level and you're assigned your race and those sort of things in your background at first level. So a lot of these books will become irrelevant after the first few levels. You might have to keep Tasha's or Martin Canyon's open if there's any spells in there. Like Tasha's has some spells that come out of here. Uh, Martin Canyon's has races, of course. Xanathar's has spells. Uh, and uh, classes and such. So you might have to keep those open if your class or your race or your background depends on that. But it, for the most part, uh, the player's handbook and maybe one other book will do. So kind of push that um, that uh, notion forward because it is something that happens. Because eventually you get like 50 million books open and you don't really need to do that. And the, the necessity to um, manage your content is is important over time. As your campaign builds, it just gets more and more unwieldy, and it just becomes a burden after a while. So just kind of be careful with that. So anyways, I'm going to go ahead and close the module activation window. These are all the books that I have in the library. Now, if you want to look at these in a different way, you can go up to books now. And anything that you have loaded in your library will show up here. 
So instead of going and digging into the modules area, you can really just click on these and that'll bring you to the reference manual for each one of those books. So this is the newer view of the content. So if you need to look something up, instead of digging through modules and then going into here and then going to reference manual, you can just go straight to books and that's like a shortcut to each reference manual for the content that you have loaded. So that's the new feature here for, for books. So now we're going to start building characters. So the, the best thing to do is to plan your build if you can. If you have access to D&D Beyond or you already have a character sheet in front of you, it's really helpful to have that ahead of time. So the first type of character creation that we're going to be doing, I should probably do it side by side, but we'll, I'll kind of do that so maybe I don't want to confuse anyone. But if you're going to use the character wizard, you'd click that button and it would pop up the wizard. So let's do that. So this is the wizard. And if you're going to do the older drag and drop method, then you would click on this green plus button and that will give you a blank sheet. So essentially this is where these things differ. So what makes this nice on the wizard, it's a little faster and it's essentially easier to quicker to build, but you have less options when it comes to customization because they don't pick up the books that are loaded that are not uh, official content from Wizards of the Coast. Or if you have homebrew stuff, it really it probably won't pick those up either. But this is just a, a kind of a, a build thing so you guys can see the difference. So the character wizard is is nice when you really want to, you know, move on and do something. So I'm going to pick a dwarf for this particular build. I'm going to do a dwarven cleric. That's what I usually use as a template and as a guide. So I'm going to click dwarf. And then it gives me the the basically the sub race selection. So I'm going to pick a hill dwarf, but I'm going to pick the one that comes out of, let's see, the player's handbook. And then it tells you all here all of the different things. And then down here does an exclamation. So it wants me to pick a skill proficiency that comes from my racial background. So in this case, I'm going to go with Smith's Tools, and that'll be one of my proficiencies that I have. Doesn't necessarily mean I have the tools themselves, but at least I can use them if I get a hold of some. And then all these other traits are just kind of telling you what you get for being this type of dwarf. They have a built-in toughness skill that will increase your hit points by one for every time you gain a level. So that's automatic. That's built into Fantasy Grounds. However, if you're going to build something like that for yourself, you'd have to hard code that or have an extension made. So some of these abilities are baked into the rule set. Some of them can be added by others. So you're not going to know what those are or how those work until you use the system. You understand the, the little nuances and the differences in rule sets and such. If you need to change the race or the sub race, you can click on either one of these buttons up here to reset. So now I'm going to go to class. And the beauty of this is this character wizard, you don't have to do this in order. The character sheets over here, these are recommended to do this in order. So once I get a little further along with the character wizard, I get done, and I'll do it this way too. So now we're going to pick our class. So we're going to pick cleric. And at this particular juncture, we get our domain. So in this case, first, we're going to be picking our proficiencies. So this will be based off of our class. So I'm going to go with medicine and I think history. That's a pretty good solid choice for a cleric. And then you pick your divine domain at this point. And then this time for the divine domain, you have all these different options depending on what books you have open. So I have quite a few options here, but I'm just going to go with the life cleric that comes out of the player's handbook. But you could pick the grave domain or kana domain. So it just depends on what content you have access to. So this is the point where maybe if you're using Cobalt Press or one or your own homebrew stuff, it may not pick up this kind of thing. So that's that's why I recommend using the drag and drop. So let's go with life domain. And then once that happens, you it will tell you a listing here of your life domain spells, which is handy. And then it defines your spell casting, and then it tells you, you know, how it's, you know, how you come up with your spell save DC and that sort of thing. 
And then you have also um, anything else that's added at this level. Um, so you have your bonus proficiency of life where you gain proficiency with heavy armor. And then you also have um, a disciple of life, which means that your healing spells are going to be more effective. So they're going to have a little bit more healing behind it. So those are just some of the features that come with this particular domain. Now we're going to click over to spells. So at this point, you get three cantrips, and I can pick which source I want to take them out of, or I'm just going to pick no source so I don't narrow it down too much. And then click on cantrips, and that will narrow that down. And then I can go through here and pick the ones that I want to use. So in this case, I'm going to use the class features that come from Rob Tui's. Uh, modules, but you can use the ones from the player's handbook, or you can use the one from whatever uh, books you you have loaded. The reason I want to use these because they're a little bit more defined. They have a little bit more of the uh, automation, if there's any, with it. But if you don't want to use those, you know, you can always just use the regular class one. So I think I'll just use those for now. I don't want to confuse the issue here. So I'm going to pick guidance as one of my my cantrips. I think uh, mending is helpful, and let's go with uh, let's go with thaumaturgy. Okay, so those are the three, um, you know, basically the three spells that I have chose for for cantrips. Now I can click on level one, and I can pick my level one spell. So the the thing about this is. Uh, when you go back to your features, there's a list of spells that are basically given to you as part of your domain. So you have domain spells, and it has a list here. So you get these spells, Bless and Cure Wounds. So I'm going to drag those over, and those are not supposed to count against your, your, uh, your spell count or how many you can have for, you know, prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and grab Bless, and then I'm going to grab, what was the other one? It was a Heal or Cure Wounds, okay? So we got that too. So those are my freebies, okay? Now I'm going to pick my the spells that I get for level one, and I believe that is, um, you get a few of those as well. And if you're uncertain, you can always go to the library if it's loaded, go to books and then you go to the player's handbook and then you go to character creation and then you can go in here and start looking up how this is going to work and there's a whole section on spells and there's a search engine here so if i come down here and look at this list i can look at the first level spells so these are all the the other spells that I can look at. So if you need a reference, you can just look at that if you have access to it. So the GM has to share these books with the, the table and the player has to activate those books as well. So that that's how you have access to those. So I want to just grab a few spells. I don't need a ton. So maybe I will do, let's see. I, So there's Sanctuary, Spare the Dying. I'll do that one if that is, is that right? Spare the, now that's a, uh, that's a cantrip. Why is it showing that? Okay. Okay, there's first level. Oh, I see. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm actually going to filter this to a player's handbook and do some searches here. So, I'm going to go with uh, Guiding Bolt. That one's always interesting. you got to spell it correctly. So Guiding Bolt is one. So I'll grab that. And what's the next one I want? Healing Word. <laughs> Kneeling Word. That's not going to... Okay, there's that. And then perhaps a couple, let's see, let's go with, uh, let's go with command. That's always interesting at lower levels anyways. Okay, so I got a few spells, so that kind of satisfies my um, spell list for now. 
And then, of course, I included those bonus spells. Those I can have prepared, and that we can deal with that later. If you're going to level up, you can do so from here by clicking this up arrow. I'm going to keep at first level so we don't have too much stuff going on. And this guy already has his domain, so I don't have to worry about that. So now we come to the ability score. So this is where a lot of people get kind of tripped up. So if you really have to override everything, you can just type out all of your ability scores here on the bottom and just disregard everything else. You can roll. So if you want to do a manual dice roll or manual entry, you can do so. You can, you know, you can roll and then change the numbers if you want. So that depends on what you want to do. And then you can also do a point buy, which is the recommended method in most cases. And then you have a standard array, which is going to give you 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. So there's different methods of doing this. But if you go ahead and do the roll part, and you're going to actually roll the dice, it'll roll this out and it will assign these in order. So if you don't like what's there, you can actually move these around. And if you have to, you can override. So if, the, if you don't like how this is laid out, you can always drag these numbers to different spots. This is actually a really well-rolled character, by the way. 14, 12, 16, 12, 13. That's, that's a lot better than the standard array. So what I'm going to do is I'll leave 12 in strength. That's fine. I'm going to move this intelligence over to dexterity. So I just drag that over. So that will give me a plus one there. A con is fine, intelligence is fine, and I'm going to switch charisma with wisdom. That should be pretty good. So now we have 12, 13, 16, 10, 17, and 12. And then it, there's the racial bonus. That's why our con is so high and our wisdom is high. As we also have the race bonus calculated in there. If you add any in ability score increases or you can add a miscellaneous adjustment like Maybe your GM gives you plus one for whatever skill or, or uh, in this case, ability score. And then you have your override, which will just totally ignore everything and just put that number in. So you have different ways of doing this. So that's the main parts there. And then, of course, your background. So I don't want to pick Acolyte because that's going to give me or double up on a lot of the skills I already have. And it's kind of boring. So I think I'm going to do... A clan crafter because that'll give me more access to different skills I don't already have so in this case clan crafter I think I'm gonna do perception for one of my skills from that and maybe let's see investigation deception it's not really a liar what's the other one performance persuasion maybe persuasion Nah, I don't see it being used very much. I'll just go with uh, investigation, maybe. And then you have more another tool proficiency. So I already have Smith's tools. So probably he's a clan crafter. So maybe he does stonework. So I give him Mason's tools for the proficiency with those. And then an additional language. So he has Dwarvish. If you already speak Dwarvish, and then you can pick another language. So I definitely want uh, Common. I guess we already have Common. So I will pick Giant, just for the hell of it. And then you have a feature here called Respect of the Stout Folk, which is kind of more role-playing sense. And now you go to Equipment. So you have a couple choices here. You can do a Starting Kit. Or you can do a select with wealth, so you can purchase with coins, uh, with your starting uh, equipment and such. I like to do the kits, but then you can also manually just search or use this list here to in all the pages to select your items. So I'm just going to click on the select the starting kit. And in this case, I'm going to do kind of like an adventurer's type. So what do we got here? So background kit. So that would be, I uh, definitely want Smith's tools. I don't care if I have Mason's tools or not. I'm going to go with a Warhammer. And I'm going to go with Chainmail. 
and then for choice three is going to be like my other weapon so i do a light crossbow and then i get either a priest pack or explorer's pack i'm going to go with the explorer's pack and then for your holy symbol you can have an amulet an emblem or a reliquary so i'm going to go with reliquary and then you can go and look through here. So maybe you want a case for your crossbow bolt. So I'm going to look that up. And here we go with a case. So this is up to your GM and, and the table if he's going to let you have a couple additional things. Maybe I want a potion of healing. So maybe the GM is nice and is going to let us start with one of those. So I can add that if I need to. Let's see, we got two potions of healing. I just wanted one. So you can adjust these up here if you need to. So that's pretty good. So once you have your all these things done, you can click on the commit button. You're gonna put your name up here. So I'm gonna put Dorig Rockfist. That's my go-to name. And then anything else, you wanna look this over before you hit commit. Once you hit commit on here, it's a done deal. It's hard to go back and fix it. You either have to start over or manually edit it from the character sheet. So you want to look at this over, make sure you got everything in here, and make sure that you got all your spells and everything that you want for this particular build. So once you have that, I'm going to go ahead and add this to the uh, character sheet, and it will come out like this one here. So that's basically how the character wizard works so once you hit that commit button the save that's it all right so everything was added and it gives you a breakdown over here on the left of the chat window and then here all the different things are added already so that's pretty slick like you you can do stuff like this and then you can add your your two proficiencies so i have uh smith's tools so i'm manually adding this because it doesn't always get added and the, in most of the cases, tools and kits don't don't normally get added anyways. So, and then the other one was Mason's tools. And this assumes that you have this kit on you. So, you know, you wouldn't use this if you don't have it. But in this case, I'm just going to put, put these on here for convenience in case we get in any crafting. And then I change the to wisdom and this automatically will add your proficiency bonus by putting it on here so if you have kits that have a role associated with it or tools or anything like that you can manually add those here if you need to and then whatever it's based on which make common sense or you can convince your gm that hey this is based on intelligence set of wisdom or whatever and you can also change that in some cases maybe you will use for mason's tools Maybe you have to carry a bunch of blocks, so maybe it would be a constitution check at that point, but using your mason's tools to, to move the, the product. So it just depends. All right, so that's kind of a custom thing that you, is optional. You don't have to do that. Um, for this stuff here, uh, for the bonus life proficiency, it says you get heavy armor. Well, that's not listed anywhere on the proficiency, so I'm just going to make a note of it. So I'm going to start a new line. I'm going to put heavy armor, and that's just denoting that I have proficiency with it. That comes from my uh, class feature. The next is, um, see, battle axe. See, now the, the weapons that you get for being a dwarf are not added on here either. So battle axe is, but, oh, warhammer is, okay, so it did add these. So when you do the drag and drop method, it doesn't add those you have to manually add them so it did add those so those are proficiencies with those particular two weapons which you normally wouldn't get as a cleric the same thing with that heavy armor you wouldn't normally get that as a cleric either except for this is the life domain so you're you're given that ability through that so that overrides the class restrictions so we got giant dwarvish okay that looks good so everything looks pretty good here uh when it um it has your proficiencies here. We used to notate which uh, proficiencies like Mason's tools and Smith's tools, but it looks like it already adds it here, which is nice. Okay, so notes, this is all your role-playing stuff. So this is gonna be a male 
And he's going to look like he's in his 40s, but he's probably, you know, close to 100 years old. He's probably a whole four foot one in height and maybe 215 pounds or something like that. And then he has, um, he's going to be lawful neutral. So neither good or evil, but lawful neutral. I guess it's not as prevalent as, you know, in other versions. So this isn't as important, but it does parse with fantasy grounds. So if your um, NPCs have a spell like protection from good, and you don't have that on your alignment, if you're a good aligned creature, that doesn't parse well. Okay, so I'm going to do Moradin as his god. This is kind of a kind of a standard dwarven god. I just kind of put that in there as a note. Now these things here, the traits and bonds and flaws, you can make up your own, or if you've picked a background that already has those, you can you can use those as a table from there to determine what those are. So you can take and roll, or you can pick. So I think what I'll do is just kind of pick some of these. So you come down here. And it's lists your features, but there's these tables down here that has these personality traits. So you can either roll randomly and have it go over here in the chat. So if I roll here, that's a four. So it says I'm full of witty um, aphorisms, and I have a proverb for every uh, occasion. So I like that. So I can actually drag, left click, and drag the text up here. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Now the next one, you get two personality traits if you want. So I'll say, I don't part with my money easily and will haggle tirelessly to get the best deal possible. I like it. So I'm going to drag and drop that one manually right from the table. So you can either roll or, or drag it right off the list. So this one is, I'll say, uh, people, I'm committed to the people. I care about aspiration. I work hard to be the best there is at my craft. I can see him doing that. And then you just go down the list here of all your tables and you either pick or roll the ones you want or you can make up your own. So I just say his bond is he owes the guild a great debt for forging him into the person he is today. And then the flaw would be I'll do anything to get my hands on something rare. I'm quick to assume someone's trying to cheat me. I think that's perfect for his little stoic. And then if you have an appearance of notes, you can put those here too. Those are all manual. The log here is for Adventures League. I don't know if that's going to stay around or not, but I know that SmiteWorks plans on working on the character sheets eventually, standardizing them, making them cleaner and such. I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but uh, if you're working on anything that has to do with character sheets, or like changing them and stuff, I would hold off until you find out uh, what SmiteWorks is going to do. All right, so here's the, the main part. This is the Actions tab. This is where all the magic happens. So essentially, when you're done building, you want to have this sheet open, and this would essentially be where you're going to spend most of your time. So if you want to select a, a token, you can open up, and you see this is all blank right now. So if I open up the any of these, I can select a token. So if I click this, and, and that could go into, I don't know, the fantasy, fantasy grounds, fantasy um, tokens. You can come in here and look for those. They do come with some. I mean, you can add your own. Uh, you have to have it in your tokens folder if you're a player, I believe. I don't know if it still lets you assign them or not. And then if you're a GM, you want your custom ones need to go in the data folder on the upper level and then you can add your own custom token. So this says fantasy and was waiting for this search engine. So this takes a bit because fantasy grounds has to build all of the thumbnails for the preview images. So if you've got a ton of tokens, it might take a minute for fantasy grounds to course through your library, build all of those uh, fancy thumbnails to show before you even select. So that's why this part is pretty slow. It's because of that. It has a ton of, like in this case, I have just tons and oodles and oodles. So if you don't want this problem, uh, lessen your load and definitely uh, think about optimizing your content in the background. If you're not going to use a bunch of the stuff, then take it out. And that's my best uh, advice there for GMs.
Uh, players, not so much. You, you don't have a lot of control over this. So it's it's going to take a minute because I got too many things to look at. And the, the thing about this is, like, if you try to force this or you get impatient, you know, you can cause this to crash on you. And what you might lose some of your work. So you got to be careful with that because if Fantasy Grounds didn't save and it crashes and I have to go back in, I may have lost some of the work I did on the character. So you got to be careful with that because that's something that um, might happen to you occasionally. Fantasy Ground saves in the background like every five minutes, but a lot of things can change in five minutes. So you have no indicator as to when that's actually saving. So that's kind of... If you turn on the console, uh, if you do the console log, it'll show you when it saves. But for the most part, you're not going to be able to um, save it. So this is hanging this up quite a bit because I've got like a gazillion different token so that's on me this is not a it's a fantasy grounds issue for optimization but it's also on me because this word fantasy is probably in a gazillion different uh places within the the adventure so i probably should have did fg space fantasy that would have narrowed it down because that's the folder that i was looking for you could also use the the arrows on the side to navigate to those instead of searching and then doing it so but you have to know what folder it's in to be able to do that so you don't always have that luxury but there again so this is kind of the thing that happens with fantasy grounds when you've got too much content uh, lots of times you'll have a folder full of maps or assets if you don't organize those rename them optimize them that sort of thing this is the kind of stuff you're going to get so the the um Basically, it's indexing issue. So when it's indexing like this, that means you've got way too much stuff. And it's trying to, what it's doing is building previews for every single thing that I have that's tagged for fantasy. And that's kind of crazy, but that's the way it works. So, yeah. Lesson learned. Don't, <laughs> don't have a bunch of stuff in there. That's basically, <laughs> I mean, it sounds ridiculous to have to say that, but it's true. I mean, if you got too much stuff in there, it, there is a limit, and it does tax your system quite a bit. So not sure what's going on with this, but if I, I exit out of this, it's probably going to lose my work. So just kind of giving you a heads up on that. Yeah, I don't know what it's doing. It's uh, definitely hanging up, though. It's probably not happy with uh, the amount of content that I have. And let me see if I can see anything. I've got my, um, yeah, it's, it's Fantasy Grounds is running about 38%. It doesn't look like it's hung up here on this end. It looks like it's still indexing is what it's doing. So just as a heads up, you know, if you got gazillions of stuff in your folders and you're trying to go through the interface, you can get this hang up. Or you might see a bunch of lag, like there might be a large, huge pause. So yeah, this is not going anywhere fast. So word to the wise, don't have too much crap. So I have like several modules. I've got just about, I mean, even different rule sets. So tokens are kind of universal. They're more for, they, they can be used in other game sets. So it doesn't narrow those down. So that sucks. So anyways, that's as far as I got. <laughs> uh, the only thing I was going to do is basically go through here and add some things so let me see if this how if this corrupts the the campaign or not so yeah i just got a message it said nope it says yeah it's not responding yeah we know that so i'm going to close it and i'm going to go right back in and let's see if i it wasted my my character or not depends on if it saved it at some point because i was pretty much done with it so we'll see but a lot of times you'll lose, like when you crash like that, you'll lose your books that you had loaded. For some reason, that gets wiped out a lot if you don't exit the right way. And you'll lose work, like some stuff you typed or perhaps you made some changes and they didn't get recorded. So those are things you got to watch out for in Fantasy Grounds. Like it will definitely bite you once in a while and it will piss you off because you won't be too happy. Um, when you lose your work. So be careful with how much content you have. So I think um, 
in the interim, I think I'll just uh, type in Fantasy Grounds Fantasy or go to the folder itself instead of looking because that, that was kind of stupid on my part. I should have waited and just went to the folder because I know where the, the default um, tokens are. But if you didn't know which folder they're in and you do a search like that, it's a risk of, of having that issue. So, okay, so we're back. And I go back to characters, and here's this. So it looks good so far. It doesn't look corrupted or anything. And I didn't get any error messages, so it must have saved. Yeah, we're, we're lucky here. So I was going to go ahead and put in the 20 crossbow bolts. And the um, crossbow itself is a two-handed weapon, so you change that to two. Warhammer can be used either one-handed or two-handed. So it really depends on how you're using it. But if you're using a shield, you can only use this as one. I mean, it's not going to prevent you, but ideally you want to remove the shield and then change that to two. But I don't know how many people remember that. But basically, if you use any two-handed weapons, you can't really benefit from your shield unless you have some kind of... Uh, you know, effect or something or some sort of feature. So let's go back to this again. So this time well, I'm going to go to the flat tokens and then I'm going to do just navigate through here instead of searching because I have so many freaking things in here that it's, it's cumbersome for the fantasy ground search index. So I will report that and say, Hey, look, what do we do with idiots like me that have, tons of content all right so fantasy tokens so we want fg fantasy tokens something like that yeah so fg i think that was the name of the folder and then there's some other ones the newer ones these heroic so these are the 3d ones so if you want those if you go to um heroic there's heroic female heroic males so here are the heroic males. So I can use this token here. I think I will use that. So I'll use this Dwarven Cleric token. And that will be my my default flat token. And then for the camera token, you go to images. And then we'll click on this camera token here. See what that brings up. And then you can look in here for the same thing to the heroic that's what it's under in case you're wondering like these are just some a handful of ones that smiteworks made and created for uh as users uh for characters but there's obviously people are going to want their own so eventually you're probably gonna have to build your own but here's the the full image and then you can take this one and drag that in there too so you have your portrait you have your flat token and you have your 3d token so that's changed a little bit since, uh, you know, a few versions ago. And this is basically what you have. To make these tokens is a little bit of work. But once you understand how it works and, you know, take the time to do it, if you're only doing like six or less, not a big deal. But when you've got a hundred of them to do, that takes a bit of work. So anyways, so that's the token issue. Um, and you got to see... You got to see me blunder and make mistakes and everything else. So that that's something that you'll learn over time. Is you have excessive content, it's going to burn you eventually. So anyway, so this is uh, down here is different modes that you have for the actions tab. So generally speaking, when you're building your character, this is the mode you're in standard and group. When you want to prepare, let's say you want to prepare some spells. I'm going to prepare Bless and Cure Wounds automatically because those are part of my domain. And then I'm going to do Healing Word, Guiding Bolt, and Command. I can have all those prepared. And I can have other spells on here too. I just happen to choose those. Uh, let's see. What else? There's your racial effects right here. These are your spells. So I just clicked on those to prepare them. And then when you're done doing that, you can go to Combat and actions and this is the basically the view that you want when you're getting ready to play and you check off your spells as you use them here's the disciple of life which adds additional three to your healing there's a dwarven resilience and stone cunning that you can use um, per per role or as you need it so 
in this case for my for my dwarf character here once he's on the combat tracker i would activate that particular um, ability because it is basically an ongoing so this is an effect that resists poison and you have advantage on saving throws versus poison so that is something i'd have on all the time this uh stone cunning is only used if you're going to roll a history check that's related to stonework or you can go into the uh, skills you can create one and you would add double your proficiency bonus to it so you can do it two different ways in that case and then here you can kind of add some things like there is a turn undead that should be added to the cleric actions so if you don't have turn undead let me see it's not really a spell but if you have like rob to ease thing or you or you have the um a way to do your own effects you can add it that way but i'm going to go into my campaign and go to spells and i'm going to add that in as an effect so these are things that you may or may not have access to depending on your table your gm but i'm going to do a search here for turn turning is not a function that's built into fantasy grounds with in this role it's, it works but it's not like automatically added to your character sheet so for instance this is cleric channel divinity turn undead so i'm going to drag and drop that in here and that's going to add that it's going to add this to my character you can also build this yourself it's just basically turn undead with the colon turned or if you don't want to do that just whenever you announce that you want to to turn you only get to do this once anyways per what is it per rest yeah see this closed my books out that's why it... yeah so you only get to do this once anyways so this would be a, a kind of an additional thing but there is an effect already built into fantasy ground so up here on the top right under this uh effect there is a i believe there's a yeah turned is right here so you would drag that to the undead it's more or less a note it doesn't really do much it just kind of i think it gives them disadvantage or something like that but nonetheless you can do it that way manually or you can put that on your sheet depending on, on how you guys want to do it but so there's the cantrips and here's the first level spells with all the little buttons that go with it so that's essentially how you do this with the character wizard so there is still some manual processes afterwards and if you want to organize your inventory you have like this big list here what you can do is nest some some content in here so like this backpack maybe you want the bedroll uh to go in it or be kind of you know basically kind of strapped to it uh maybe this case for your crossbow bolts will stay out but my mess kit healing potions actually So this is how you organize. So essentially you just type the location of the container on the right hand side. So for instance, my crossbow bolts, I have the bolts down here, I believe. Let's see, there's the case, there's the, no, there's no ammo. So I'm gonna have to ask my GM if I can have some ammo. So I'm gonna do bolts. and there we go so here's the crossbow bolts 20 of them drag and drop that on here so in this case this is going to be going in the case and then my reliquary whatever that is maybe i'll put that in my pouch so it doesn't all have to go in my backpack you can put whatever container goes in where and you can set up your own too it doesn't have to be that and then here's here you unequip or equip your shield. So this is something that comes up a little bit. I was talking about earlier 
And when you're using, uh, in this case, this is a dwarf, and he, you know he's got a couple two-handed weapons here. So usually I add like a function here so that it's easier for the player and for myself, so I don't have to keep going over to this page and um, unselecting or or unequipping the shield. I just make a an effect that's going to cancel that out for convenience. So if I go into standard and group. Over here on the right, I can type in, uh, I'll just say standard actions. It's, these are just kind of basic actions. And then all I'm doing now is customizing the sheet a little bit. And I know that down the road, like these little things here will help a lot. And then over here on the left, I'm going to call this uh, drop shield or I'll just say remove shield, remove shield. This is not necessarily dropping it. You might just like throw it on your back or something. So remove shield. That's just the name of this action. And then I'm just going to right click, go to add action. And in this case, it's going to be an effect. And then I'm going to edit it with this little um, magnifying glass. And I'll just call this remove shield because that's the title of this action. And you put a semicolon after there because that's going to tell it to ignore everything over on this side. And then I'm going to do armor class, so AC colon minus two. So what that does is it cancels out the plus two bonus that comes from your shield. And then for targets, I'm going to put it to self. So that's all that does is a description a condition and a modifier. So the condition is AC, negative two is a modifier. So that's how these are written. Once you understand all the acronyms and the syntax for that, you can write your own. It's pretty pretty basic. You just got to get used to what it looks like. And those are all listed in the 5e effects wiki, or most of them are anyways. So with that, when I when it comes to this player using their shield, when we're in combat, and he says, well, I want to use my Warhammer two-handed. It doesn't automatically remove the shield. So I'll just click that, and it puts it on the effects area, and it temporarily cancels out the shield bonus. Then when the player's done, when they want to re-equip their shield, they can go to the effects area, and they can remove it themselves. I mean, as the GM, I can add this manually, but if I add anything, the player can't remove it. So it's better when they add the effects themselves. That way they can remove it themselves. If you put it on them, they can't do it. So that's that's the, the beauty of that. Another thing you could do is like if you have torches, let's say, and, and you want to light those up and make it easier. If you want to use it for a weapon or perhaps, you know, an item that's going to be transferred to another player, uh, like say you want to throw it and that sort of thing. There's ways to do that. It's it's kind of a pain in the butt, but it can be done. Like you can't just drag this um, as an effect because it really doesn't. But it tells you the lighting and it deals one fire damage, so it gives you the the information. It would be nice if I can just drag this on here and make this an effect, but it doesn't do that. So you have to create another action. So I have uh, Rob Two E's thing loaded, which is already done. I don't have to build it myself so if i go to spells and then type in torch i already have something like that that's already already built so i don't have to do it so this is an item it's just a torch but it's built like an effect just kind of like what i did with that remove shield so if i drag and drop that down here it creates the action in which i can use that torch now as not only a weapon, but also I can activate the lighting on it. And you can also set up the usages. So if I wanted to change this to preparation, I can change this to 10 because I have 10 torches in my inventory. And I can change this to once. So you only get to use them one time. They don't normally get more than one use out of those. So that'll keep track of how many I use. So under combat and actions, I can check these off as I use the torches. And that just is a tally to keep track of how many you've used. And then you go into your inventory afterwards 
and you adjust how many you have in your backpack. It doesn't correlate without using an extension. So if if you want it to automatically take it out of your inventory, you're going to have to find an extension. I think Mad Nomad has one that will that'll do that. But there there again, this is just some of the little things that come up um, that you'll notice. So this makes it a little bit more convenient because you have the damage button, you have the effect of the lighting, you have the attack roll in case you want to thump somebody with it, and then you have the uh, effect uh, label that tells you you have the torch, it's bright light, 20 dim to 40, or 20 bright to, 20, to 40 dim. So these are just little tweaks that you'll learn over time. These are not built into Fantasy Grounds. They're, they can be achieved, and this is true of other rule sets. You have to kind of get used to how the rule set interfaces with Fantasy Grounds, and you have to learn the, um, the little intricacies and all the little ifs, ands, and buts, and you'll learn eventually the limitations of the platform and you know what walls you're going to face because you can't automate every single thing. It's just... It's impossible. You can do it quite a bit, but you don't necessarily want to automate everything because it, it doesn't, it's not worth it a lot of times. It's, it's, and if you use extensions to do more, sometimes those break and it, it can just be a pain in the ass. So it just depends on, you know, your quality of life versus, you know, the hassle of maintaining that stuff. So it just depends. So this is just a kind of a overview of that. So when you do drag and drop, this is this was a character wizard. So the drag and drop's a little bit more drawn out, and I'm going to do the first part of it, not all that secondary stuff, because that was, you know, I've already covered that, but this is just going to be how the traditional way of building a character. So in this case, I'm going back to characters. Here's the one I, I started with in the beginning. And generally speaking, there is no way to do rolling or anything. You have to do it manually. So you either roll physical dice, tell your DM to click on single click on these cells and add it in, or you can do a dice command, which is um, slash die, uh, which is dice, 4D6K1, something like that. And what that'll do is it'll roll four six-sided and keep the, it'll drop the lowest, or D1, I should say. So it'll drop the, the lowest. So I want to left click and drag this command or this text here into this window so I can just click on that and I don't have to keep typing it over and over. So there's 11. So you can just manually have your players roll depending on what your your table rules are or your homebrew. So, so far these aren't too bad rolls except for that six. All right. So there we go. Not bad, except for that six. You know, I think I'm going to put that six. You can now drag this value to any one of the cells. So I think he's going to be a very boisterous kind of nasty. So he's not doesn't have a very good charisma. Uh, I'm going to give him an 11 strength. He's not very tough, but he is uh, rather wise. So give him. This is going to be another cleric. Same thing. Leave the 10 in there. Go with a 14 in con. Oops. And then go with a 16 for this dexterity. So he's pretty quick. So anyways, this is just uh, the first part of doing drag and drop. So you want a battle-ready character. So ability scores, background, race, class. So if you're using custom content or third-party content, this is how you want to build it. And then when you want to do the backgrounds, you just bring up your list, whether they're custom or the official ones. I'm going to build this the same way, essentially. So he was a, a clan crafter, I believe. Where did that go? Oh, maybe I don't have it loaded. So I'll just do Acolyte. So you do your background, and that adds the content manually. And once you do that, you're committed. So unlike the character wizard where you can kind of mix and match and, and do stuff, this once you drag this stuff over here, you're committed. You have to either start over or you have to go into your abilities here and delete them out and drag another one over. So that's one of the drawbacks from doing this way. And now we're going to do the race. So come over to races. And we're going to do a dwarf again from the player's handbook. And we're going to pick the hill dwarf, 
and hit select. So now that puts the Hildorf in here. And now for class and level, you're going to open this up and go to your classes over here on the right. And we're going to do Cleric from the Player's Handbook. And then we did, I believe it was History and Medicine. And then hit this, uh, which will confirm. And now we're going to do the Life Domain, confirm, and there we go. So that's essentially the process for doing, that's the main part of doing the drag and drop. The next thing is you'll still have to do the customization I did earlier. In this case, you're going to have to add the proficiencies here manually, like the uh, heavy armor. And then for the weapons, I need to do Warhammer and Battle Axe. So these do not get added um, automatically. So it just depends on the rule set and how it's written. But this was the, the choices. And then for languages, I want a giant. And we already had common, so we don't have to pick that. And then for this type of stuff, like we would want like this tool proficiency. I'd probably put a note here. This was uh, Smith's tools. But then we also, this is just a notation. And then also over here, for proficiencies, you could add that on, on a new line. So you could say tools. And then this was Mason's tools. So this is just stuff that uh, was kind of different from the character wizard because that added some of that stuff in. Whereas this one doesn't, you have to manually add it in. And then for your other stuff, like your inventory, you can drag and drop each each item um, from the inventory. Or if you have Rob Tui's, uh, what is that, parcels, their uh, background item parcels. So I have that loaded. But it looks like the, when I crashed, it, it, it left me in the dark here. But you basically either manually drag and drop all of your equipment on here from the items. Or maybe your GM has a store set up where you can drag things in or if you know how to make parcels you can build or you can buy something that already has all the items grouped together and you just drag it over one time and you're done with it so if i go into the the modules yeah so here's the background equipment and here are the parcels so i picked an acolyte so i would drag over this background equipment into the into the uh, inventory. So if I drag this in there, that's going to put in all the stuff on my background. And then there's also um, stuff for classes. So it's not just not just the uh, here's the starting equipment for cleric. So I can drag and drop that in there too. So that puts it all in there a lot more quickly. But I like the character wizard version a little better because you have a little bit more selection. It's a little less uh, manual. And then, of course, I need to, you know, you go in here and redo your inventory, get that all cleaned up. And then, of course, your notes. We already did all that manually when we were doing the first character. Uh, the log, that's for Adventures League. And then your access tab, same thing. You have to set these up anyway. So this is not automated. But in this case, he has a mace. I wasn't given that choice because I did the drag and drop method of the Rob Tui parcel, but you could just go back later and say, okay, I don't want the mace. I want to switch that for a Warhammer. And you talk to your GM about it and then manually dragging over your spells and any other actions that are associated. So that's the difference between the drag and drop. A little less automated. Uh, it takes a little bit more time to do the drag and drop. But it allows you to use custom content like third-party stuff, homebrew, that sort of thing. Uh, that's probably the only way it's really going to work if you do it this way. If you try to do the character wizard, it may or may not work depending on how that was built. And like I said, it's mostly geared around the official book. So uh, if you have a bunch of you know player-facing content that you made for your homebrew table, you want to build via drag and drop. And the thing to remember is ability scores, background, race, and class. There's a reason for that, mainly because you can get doubling up and stuff. So when I was building this, 
when I picked this Acolyte, I didn't look carefully. I did this intentionally. So when you go to Skills, I only have, let's see, one, two, three, four. Actually, this turned out right. But generally speaking, it can double up and it won't tell you that. So here's History, Insight, Medicine, Religion. So I got lucky. I didn't have any double up. But when you do the drag and drop method, a lot of times this stuff will double up and you won't know. When you're using the, the uh, character wizard, it's going to give you the option to fix it and all that before you move on. It'll warn you that you have a double or that you need to pick another one. That's what it does. So this, this case I lucked out. I didn't have any double up. I thought the acolyte would double up with the um, with the, the class domain that I have, the life domain, but I guess it didn't. So I got lucky there, but that's a, one of the drawbacks for using the drag and drop is that it doesn't doesn't give you any warning if there's doubling up. And then, of course, you got a little a lot of manually tweaking to do. You still have to do that with the character wizard a little, but not as much. So that's basically the majority of what I had to show for character creation. I wish I had more knowledge of the other rule sets because this only helps like, you know, 70% of the people that use Fantasy Grounds. The other 30 are using, you know, other rule sets. So I'm not as, you know, basically as versed on those. So I can't do a lot of that, but I do what I can. And in this case, this is for the D&D 5e rule set. It's April 19th, 2024. Uh, Fantasy Grounds version 4.5.6. So if you're looking, or 4.5. Yeah, it's 4.5.6. So if you're looking at this in the future, this is how new or old it is. And anyone that's uh, been around for a bit, um, thanks again for donating to my computer cause. I had uh, done a um, GoFundMe because my computer went out. I didn't have the money to fix it. And it was basically crashing and giving me all kinds of trouble. So... I, I was going to do a conversion video today, but I kind of decided I'll start that back up next week. So uh, next Friday, I'm going to continue my um, the uh, conversion series that I've been started with, which is the uh, Lost Caverns of Sojcon. I, I kind of blew that off today. I was like, no, nah, I don't feel like doing it. And I, I don't know. I just when I lost my computer I kind of lost my momentum and now I'm kind of just slowly starting to get back and I thought you know probably the most helpful thing would be to probably build a character on on fantasy grounds especially with a lot of newer people or if you haven't played in a while uh, this would be probably be more helpful in the long run but anyway